Yeah, all right, good. All right, <clears throat> excellent. We're going to get started then. I know a few people are still filtering, but um, it's a good time to start. So, hello. Nice to see you all. Um, I really love coming to NDC conferences. They are among my favorite of all the software conferences, which is why I've uh, particularly wanted to come out to this one. And I hope you're going to have a really good time, uh, especially if it's your first NDC. Uh, now, before we get started, I'd really just like to get a bit of a sense of who's in the room. So, can you give me a, a, a signal, put up your hand, if you do any sort of client-side web development today with some framework like Angular, React, Vue, Knockout, Elm, yeah, anything like that? Yeah? All right. So, I'd say that's about half of the room, maybe a touch over. And, um, and how many of you are .NET developers? That's like two-thirds. Okay, cool. So, we've got some good overlap there. And finally... How many of you have ever heard of this Blazor thing and have some sort of vague sense of what that is? All right, that's about a third of you, maybe, maybe close to a half as well. Okay, good. All right, so I think you are in the right room and this, uh, this should be fun. So my name's Steve and I work at Microsoft and I'm on the ASP.NET team. And I've had quite a lot of different roles on the ASP.NET team over the years. Uh, but mostly I've focused on client-side scenarios, things where people are trying to write JavaScript in a browser, historically. And I've done a, a bunch of stuff on that. Um, but more recently, I've had this opportunity to work on a very exciting new uh, experimental project to bring .NET into the browser. And that's what this is all about today. So we're going to get into that in a lot of detail. Obviously, that's what the talk is about. But before we get to it, I just want to raise this question of why on earth is this relevant? Why should anybody be trying to push this sort of thing? Why should you care? Uh, and, and is this really relevant to our industry? So let's take a step back and think about software more generally. What kind of software exists? What sort of platforms can people target? What kind of languages can people use? Well, of course, software can run on personal computers, desktops or laptops. That's a very traditional way of thinking about software. And as well as that, since the late 90s at least, there's been a strong market for native mobile apps as well, which is you know, more or less the same thing, but just on a smaller screen. And that's not all. Besides that, a lot of us write code that's designed to run on servers. And of course, those servers these days, there's a good chance they're going to be in the cloud, but maybe it's just some machine that's under someone's desk somewhere, but basically writing code that runs on a server also takes up a lot of our time. There are other types of software too, uh, for example, games. Of course, there are many different uh, game consoles and different pieces of gaming hardware, as well as writing games for mobiles and other types of devices. And finally, there's software that runs on embedded devices. So that might be embedded into some kind of scientific equipment, like on this icon, or maybe it's software that powers a car or a space shuttle or a children's toy or anything else like that, embedded software. Okay, so lots of different types of software. And one thing that all of these have got in common is that when you're building this software, you've got a wide range of choices of languages and technology platforms that you can choose to use. You can use very high-level languages, like managed languages, such as Java or .NET, or you could use very low-level languages, like you could write plain machine code if you wanted, or something in C. And as well as that, there are lots of languages that target specific specializations, such as scientific programming or uh, functional programming, if you, if you want to think of that as a specialization, with languages like Haskell. So the software industry is pretty mature, and there's a wide range of choices for you, for your team to decide what's best for the kind of problems you're solving and what skill set your background is. But there's another type of software as well that greatly concerns me, and that is software that's designed to run in a browser. And you could make the argument that browser is the biggest runtime there is in the world. There are more people who can run software in a browser than anything else. But one thing that's not so cool about browser development is that, until very recently, you were essentially limited to one language. It's been the domain exclusively of JavaScript. Now, I know that there are other languages that compile to JavaScript, and there are even some edge case type things like Elm, but more or less everyone is doing stuff that resembles JavaScript. Even if it compiles to JavaScript, it's the same runtime, the same basic set of constraints, the same basic kind of feel. And that is a shame for us as an industry, because it means that we're not able to take advantage of all the advances that are taking place in the rest of software. Wouldn't it be nicer if web development could grow up a little bit and join the rest of the software industry uh, with a much broader spectrum of choices for developers? 
And that wasn't really possible until recently because of this marvelous thing that's swooping in to save us all, which is WebAssembly. I'm sure you've heard of it. WebAssembly is a bytecode format that is now supported in all uh, up-to-date browsers, including mobiles. And the idea with WebAssembly is you can compile from whatever language you want to WebAssembly, and then you can run that code directly in the browser. And you don't have to just use one specific type of thing. So that is a very promising development for web developers. And that, of course, gets us thinking, what sort of things would we like to run on WebAssembly? And I'm part of the .NET team, so of course, for me, one of my main interests is, well, could we run .NET on WebAssembly? And would anyone want to do that? What sort of benefits would there be? Well, I think we can probably agree that there is a bunch of benefits that would be uh, of interest to web developers if this was a realistic option. Uh, for example, unlike the world of JavaScript, .NET is relatively stable and mature. It's been around for, what, 18 years now, and it's largely maintained uh, back compatibility throughout that process. It's very, very constant and reliable year after year for getting your work done. As well as that, it's maintained a reputation of being very fast and secure. Uh, the current .NET Core runtimes is going to be able to run your code just about as fast as any code that you're going to write in a much lower level language while giving you a much higher level of productivity as a developer. But you know that if you're a .NET developer. And the rest of you will probably agree that it can be said for other managed languages as well. Okay. There's been tons of innovation in the languages in .NET space, of course, in C Sharp and F Sharp. They're always adding new features pretty much on a monthly basis. So that's always remaining up to date. And then finally, the thing that uh, Microsoft's development division has always had a reputation for is building first-rate development tooling. So industry-leading productivity in your IDEs there. So quite a bundle of benefits that, if it were realistically possible to run in a browser, would hopefully be interesting. And until a few years ago, it was possible because we had Silverlight. And you could run .NET in the browser on a plugin. But that doesn't really work in the modern world, plugins. So WebAssembly gives us a new opportunity to reinvent the idea of .NET in a browser, but purely based on open standards and running on any device. And that's what brings us to Blazor. Blazor is our experimental project from the, .NET, from the ASP.NET team specifically uh, that's looking into what would it be like to build .NET applications in the black browser in a very modern way? So it's a user interface stack that runs on .NET, which itself runs on WebAssembly in any browser. Okay? Now, if you're wondering where the name for Blazor comes from, well, it's a composition of two words. The Azer part of it comes from Razor, which is the C-sharp and HTML syntax that we'll be seeing a lot of in this talk. And the blur part of it obviously comes from blockchain. Because, you know, blockchain is really cool and everything should be blockchain these days, right? And we haven't admittedly figured out how blockchain is involved in this yet, but when we do, we'll add that into a future version. Not really. Not really, of course. The B comes from browser because we're ruining Razor inside a browser. And the L, it just sounds better. There we go. That's a perfectly good business justification. All right, so that's Blazor, and that's what I want to show you in some detail in this talk. The way we're going to structure this talk is in two parts. So in the first part, I want to show you what it's like to create a new Blazor application. I'll show you what the project templates are like, and I'll use that as an opportunity to explain to you how it's working behind the scenes. And after we've got some of that basic level information about how this is working, I want to move on to building a bigger application. Because I don't want to just get stuck at the hello world level. I want to show you some more interesting architectural questions and some of the more uh, advanced things that you can do with Blazor. So we'll move on to that. But let's get started with creating a new project. And there are a couple of different project types available in Blazor right now. The simplest one is to create a pure client-side application. It's just running .NET in the browser and doesn't have any opinions about what you're doing on the server. So I'm going to create a project. And I'm going to do it using Visual Studio on Windows. Now, that's what we've got the best tooling for at the moment. Uh, longer term, we hope to expand that to, um, to be more cross-platform and to be, support other kinds of uh, development environments. But where we're starting right now in this project is in VS on Windows. So what I've done already is I've installed the Blazor extension for Visual Studio. And at the end of this talk, I'll give you the link so you can go and download that as well yourself. And once I've done that, I can create a new project. So I'll go File, New Project. And uh, from the list of project types, I'll choose an ASP.NET Core web application. And we'll give it a name. Let's call it NDC Blazor. 
and I'll say go on that. And then it'll say, all right, what kind of ASP.NET Core application do you want to produce? And we've got all the usual choices, but because I've installed this extension, we've also got these two Blazor options as well. So I'm going to choose a plain Blazor standalone client-side application first. And it's going to create that project for me. And it's going to fetch and install all of the dependencies necessary so I should be able to compile this and get it running. OK, now first I want to show it running in a browser so you can see what the application starting point UI looks like and then we'll jump into the code and see how it's actually implemented and how you can build more stuff with it. So I'm going to pop that up in a browser and when my server starts responding to me in a few seconds, uh, we should see the initial UI coming up there. OK, so as you can see, the uh, project template creates something that's a bit like a dashboard type application because that's a very common scenario for this sort of technology. And what's in there? Well, we've got uh, client-side back-forward navigation like you'd expect. And we've got a couple of examples of components. So we've got this counter component here uh, that just counts the number of times that you've clicked on a button. And we've also got the simple fetch data example which makes an HTTP request to some location on a server, fetches some JSON data, and renders it as an HTML table. Okay, pretty simple stuff. Um, so this is the sort of application that traditionally people would build with a JavaScript library like Vue or React or Angular or that sort of thing. So let's have a look in our project and we'll try and spot the JavaScript, shall we? Let's see what files we've got in here. Uh, well, we've got some CSS and some HTML. Uh, we've got these CSHTML files, that's Razor uh, files, which I'll show you in a sec. And we've got a JSON config and we've got a C Sharp file. So there's no JavaScript at all in this application. It's purely a .NET plus HTML and CSS application. And as for what these components are and what they do and how they work. Well, let's take a look at one. Let's start with the counter component. So if you recall, it just counts the number of times that you click on a button. The implementation for that looks like this. Okay, so this is Razor. I expect a lot of you have seen it, but if you haven't, Razor is a syntax for combining HTML and C Sharp in a pretty natural kind of way. And what we're doing here is at the top, we've got this directive called page. And this tells the router that this component acts as the handler for a particular URL. So any Blazor component can act as a handler for a URL if you want it to, but they don't all have to. It's up to you. This one listens for the counter URL, and it's going to display a little bit of HTML. It's also got some C Sharp. So we've got this variable current count that's going to show how many times you've clicked. We'll use Razor syntax to display that current count value, and we've got a button that says when you click it, we're going to call this C Sharp method increment count, and that will increment it, and everything will update. Okay, does that make sense? Reasonably clear? No, no obvious objections. All right, so let's have a look at another one. Let's have a look at this fetch data one. This is an example of making an HTTP request. And again, it's got the page directive up at the top there. Uh, this has also got an inject directive because Blazor applications support dependency injection. So we can inject services into components. Here we're injecting an HTTP client that lets us make requests. Uh, that's the standard .NET HTTP client that a lot of you will be familiar with. And then down at the bottom, we've got some C Sharp code. We're declaring a class to specify what kind of data we're expecting to get back from the server. And then we can use normal C Sharp programming like async and await and HTTP get requests to fetch some data, turn it into an array of weather forecasts. And then up here, we can use some Razor code to render an HTML table. Very straightforward kind of things. Now, because this is a standalone client-only application, there's no server to get data from. So we're just fetching a static JSON file from disk. But in other cases, you would call a actual server-side endpoint. But the client-side code doesn't know or care about that. All right, so that's some basics. Uh, let me show you a little bit more stuff that you can do with components. So I, I'm going to be trying to impress upon you the fact that components are a very flexible concept, that you can do almost anything that you want to with components. Uh, for example, uh, one of the most basic and useful things you can do is use one component inside another. Here's the index page. This is like the home page here. So as you can see, it's displaying this how is Blazor working for you thing down there. And that is coming from another component, which is called survey prompt. And we can trivially just use any component inside another. So if, for whatever crazy reason, I decide that I want to have a counter on my home page, I can simply type out counter, I get IntelliSense, and then my counter is going to be added 
to the application right there. So if I come back and I reload in the browser now, we should see we've got a counter right there on the home page as well. And of course, it's a functional counter because all components just encapsulate their own behaviors, and that's going to work fine. Um, but we can do more stuff with it than that. For example, we can pass parameters into them. Let's say instead of incrementing by one every time, I want it to go up by a variable amount. So I'm going to go to my counter, and I'm going to add a parameter. Parameter of type int, and I'll call it increment amount. And we'll give that some getters and setters and a default value of one. And then I'll say, when we call this method, we're going to increase by the increment amount. Okay? And so now, here, where I've got this counter, I want to use this increment amount parameter. So I can, just using IntelliSense, pick the parameter that I want to pass. Let's say I want it to increment by eight now, and then, hopefully, it will do what I have told it. So let's come back and reload. And now, when I click this, you'll see it's going up in eights rather than ones, whereas this other counter still goes up in ones because I haven't passed any parameter to that. Okay. So that gives you a bit of sense of some things that you can do with components, but I haven't really explained very much about how this works behind the scenes yet. I'm sure some of you are thinking, well, hang on, this is .NET and it's running on WebAssembly, but how does that work? Like, how does the browser know to run .NET? What, what are you even sending to the browser anyway? Is this running on the server in some way? Well, let me show you, okay? Probably the easiest way to understand it is by looking at the browser's network tab so we can see exactly what stuff we're sending to the browser. So I'm going to do a hard reload there. And let's start by talking about how big this thing is. So we're embedding an entire .NET runtime into a page here. So what's that going to be, like hundreds of megs? Well, uh, firstly, we can see it's 18 HTTP requests totaling 1.81 megabytes. So 1.81 megs is pretty small for a .NET runtime, but it's also a, still a little bit big for a web application. So I'm sure some of you would like it to be smaller than that. We want it to be smaller than that as well. Sometimes we talk to customers and they say, hey, I don't care. I'm writing internal apps. I don't mind if it's 10 megs. It's no problem for me. Um, but at least those of us on the team are very determined that we're going to make this number quite a lot smaller. We've got lots of optimizations lined up uh, that we intend to get this number out of the box to be a much lower value than 1.8 megs. But anyway, we're only just getting started with the optimizations right now. So this is what we've got. And what does 1.8 megs buy you these days? Well, what do you get for your 1.8 megs? You get some HTML that we're initially sending down to the browser. We're getting some CSS as well. And we're getting some JavaScript. So blazor.js, where's that coming from? We don't have any JavaScript in our solution, so where's this JS coming from? And what's this thing? Mono.wasm? What's mono involved in this for? This is WebAssembly, of course. So wasm is the file extension for WebAssembly binaries, and mono is the .NET runtime that we are using here. As I'm sure many of you will be aware, there are lots of different .NET runtimes available. There's .NET Framework, there's .NET Core, there's Core RT, there's Mono, and there's probably loads of other ones as well. The idea with all of this is that there's a standard. It's called .NET Standard. And when you write your code and compile it against .NET Standard, then your code can run on any .NET Standard compliant runtime. And Mono is a .NET runtime. It, in fact, is Microsoft's official preferred .NET runtime for client scenarios. So for things like native mobile apps and for things like games uh, on Unity. So Mono is an incredibly widely used, incredibly mature and stable .NET runtime. It's been around for a long time. And the current versions of it are compliant with .NET Standard 2 or 2.1 or whatever they've got to right now. So that's what we're using here. We've got a build of Mono, which is compiled to WebAssembly, and so it can run inside the browser. And because we've got that, we can send regular .NET assemblies down into the browser. So when you compile your Blazor application, we're not compiling your C Sharp into JavaScript or WebAssembly or anything like that. We're just compiling normal .NET assemblies. And that's why the build times can be so fast. It just uses all the existing toolchain. And then we send these normal .NET assemblies down into the browser, and we load them into mono.wasm, and it just runs them. And we are very happy about that. OK? So that's some of what's going on. Um, but let's understand a little bit more. Where are these JS files coming from? And how does the browser even know to load all this stuff? Well, let's have a look in here. Let's have a look at this index.html file. This is the initial HTML that gets get sent down to the browser 
when the user loads your page. And the idea here is that this is your HTML and you can do whatever you want with it. So you can come to this file and you can add your own CSS, your own references to the JavaScript or meta tags or whatever you want, it's entirely up to you. The only special bit is this script type equals Blazor boot. And that is the magic thing that knows how to load and kickstart the Blazor application. So what happens is when you compile your application, we replace that script tag with something that the browser can understand. So by the time this gets to the browser, it looks slightly different. It looks like this. So it's the same content that you just saw before, but the script type equals blazer boot has been replaced by this other script tag, which loads a, a file that's embedded into the framework called blazer.js, and that in turn knows how to load and start up the mono WebAssembly runtime. It also gets a bit of config about like what your application entry point is and what you're referencing, things like that. So that is how the browser is able to load and start up the .NET runtime there. So I hope that makes sense to you. And that's how we can create a pure client-side application. When you publish this application, what you get out of it is a set of static files. And you can deploy those static files to any web server that can serve static files, which is all of them. So you don't need to have .NET on the server. You can deploy to anything that you feel like. It could be GitHub Pages if you want to. We've got an example of that. It could be Azure Blob Storage, anything at all. You don't need .NET on the server if you don't want to. But we know that a lot of people do want to have .NET in the server, and there are some significant advantages to using the same platform for both server and client. So we've got another project template as well. An example of setting up a Blazor application that is connected to an ASP.NET Core backend. Let me show you that. I'm gonna close this solution, and then I'm gonna go File, New, Project, and this time I'm going to choose Blazor ASP.NET Core Hosted. Okay, and we'll see what comes out of there will be a little bit different from what we had before. Although, when it's running, it will hopefully look exactly the same. It should have the same functionality as far as an end user is concerned. So I'm just bringing that up in a browser to show you that right now. And we can see that it looks exactly the same as before. It's got the same functionality. The only thing that's really different is this time, instead of fetching a plain JSON file from disk, it's making a request to a real API endpoint on the ASP.NET server. So let's have a, have a quick look at some of the code that we've got up here. You can see that Unlike where we just had one project before, we've now got three different projects, client, server, and shared. Now, you can probably guess what each of those three things are, but in case you're being a little bit dim this morning, I'm gonna just quickly run through each of those. Uh, client, obviously, is the Blazor client application. It's the same thing that we saw before. It's got the same set of components in it. It works basically the same, apart from when it's talking to the server. Then we've got the server project, which is a normal .NET core ASP.NET Core web application. The only thing that's a little bit special about it is that this thing knows how to host the Blazor user interface. So this is the application that we're actually starting up and running there, and it returns the Blazor UI. And the way it knows how to do that is that it, it takes a dependency on the Blazor client application. We've got a project reference to it there. And then when we configure the application uh, request processing pipeline down here in this configure method. We're configuring usual ASP.NET Core stuff, but then we've got this exciting little thing down here. This new bit of middleware, use Blazor, takes a reference. It says, well, which Blazor application do you want me to host? And then it's going to return the user interface for that. And this is set up to work correctly, both when you're building and running locally, it also works correctly with publishing. So when you publish this server project, it's going to automatically include everything it needs from the client application as well, so when you deploy it, your client app will just show up, okay? And then the third and final project, perhaps the most interesting one, conceptually at least, is the shared project. Now this is just a standard .NET standard class library, and you can just put all normal class library things in there, and as you can probably guess, the whole point of this is that we can share code now, trivially, between server and client. And that's really useful, particularly for things like domain classes. So here I've got this weather forecast class that defines the information that the server and client will be exchanging. And then we can use this in both the server and client projects. So here's the server side code here that's gonna return a set of weather forecasts, just random data, but you get the idea. And then on the client, we don't have to define another copy of that type definition. Inside 
fetch data here, you'll see we don't have our own fetch data class. We just use the one from the shared project. So getting some data from the server is, is trivial. It's just give me a bunch of weather forecasts, please, and the server does. And that makes the development experience really, really convenient because you're not dealing with this awkward mismatch between server and client technologies. You're not having to worry about like, how stuff is represented differently in different ways and about trying to keep stuff in sync between your server-side code and your client-side code. It's always in sync because it's literally just the same class and you can just exchange instances as long as they're JSON serializable. So that makes things very straightforward for you as a developer. Okay. So that's some basic hello world type stuff. But you're, a, you're not a, a beginner audience, right? You're a fairly advanced bunch of people and you're uh, hopefully going to be interested in taking this a little bit further. Uh, I want to show you now a bigger, more sophisticated application that gives me an opportunity to talk about some architectural stuff with you and about some of the more advanced features inside Blazor. So I'm going to show you a sample application that we've been working on. It's called Flight Finder. And the idea with Flight Finder, it's a bit like a sort of travel booking tool. So you can go and search for flights. And then when you see some flights that you like, you can add them to a short list and compare them and decide which flight is the best one for you uh, that you want to book. Okay? So I'm going to walk you through a series of different uh, features and functionality that we're going to add to this application, starting with how it is structured and how it manages state within the application. Okay? So let's open the source code for this right now. Uh, where is it? It's right here. Okay. And like usual, I want to start by running it in a browser so that you can see what sort of thing this is. So we're popping that open here. You can close these other tabs probably. And you will see here's the initial UI and it lets us search for flights. So for example, let's say that I want to go from Minneapolis, uh, St. Paul's there, and I would like to go to, I don't know, Miami International. Why not? And I would like to depart. When would I like to depart? Maybe tomorrow, and then I'll come back on, I don't know, Saturday. Oh, there's a bit of a bug here. I've just noticed at this exact moment. That should probably say return, not arrive, because it's a bit weird to be able to specify when you arrive, like, oh, I want to be in the air for nine days, please. That'll be fun. Um, <laughs> Anyway, let's not worry about that. Um, let's imagine that this is a business trip, okay? So our employers are paying for it. So I think quite legitimately we can go with first, right? Our corporate travel policy probably allows that, I would hope. And then we'll click on search and we'll get back some data from the server. Now, if I click this more than once, it will return completely different data each time. And if you know the airline industry, you'll know it's kind of mad, the idea that Qantas would be flying that route and that the price differences would be like this. So as you can probably guess, this is not real data. This talk is not about the complicated world of airline pricing algorithms or airline routing or anything like that. So I'm just returning random data, but you get the idea. This is about building the actual client-side UI. So we can do searches, and then we can eventually add some flights to our shortlist. But how is it implemented? Well, let's have a look. Okay. As you see, it's the same project structure that I just showed you before in the Blazor hosted template. So we've got a client project, a server, and a shared. And like you'd expect, the client project has got a bunch of Blazor components that represent different parts of the UI, things like the search area and search results and other things like that. We'll get to more of that in a minute. Uh, then we've also got a server project, which is a normal ASP.NET Core server. And it's got a couple of different controllers that can return data when you issue searches. And then finally, we've got our shared project. And inside shared, we can add all the stuff that's common to both server and client. So in this case, my domain types are things like airport. Airports have got a code and a name. Uh, we've got flight segment, uh, which has got like airline, departure date, arrival date, that sort of thing. And we've got an itinerary, which combines an outbound segment and a return segment and has a price. Uh, we've got search criteria, and that models the stuff that the user would type into those search controls, such as which airport they're going from and to, and oh, look, I got the, the type name correct there. So that's the return date. And we've got a ticket class, uh, which itself is an enum, and then we've got some extension methods on that to render that out to some nice human readable strings. Okay, so that somewhat makes sense. And the point of having all of these types inside our shared project is that we can use them on our server and we can exchange data in a very convenient way with the client. For example, 
here's the flight search controller on the server. It's a normal ASP.NET Core API endpoint, and it's going to receive from the client a strongly typed search criteria object containing all the information that the user entered into that box, and it's going to return a set of itineraries. And like I said before, the data returns are just random, but uh, it's up to you as an exercise to put in a real pricing rule system if you actually want to do that kind of thing. And then on the client, we can, of course, make requests, and we get back our data in a nice, strongly typed way, and we can just render it. Okay? So... I hope that makes sense. But let's have a look at some of these Blazor components now. Um, in fact, the only one that I really want to focus on initially is this one down here, main.cshtml, because that's where the application all comes together. Inside main, we're defining the overall structure of the UI. And as you can see at the top, we've got this search uh, component there, where the user types in their search criteria. Below that, we've got search results, and below that, we've got shortlist, or rather we will do later when we've implemented it in about five minutes. But there's some other pretty weird stuff in here as well that's probably making you wonder what on earth is going on. So what is this? What is an app state? Why are we injecting it? What are we injecting it with? Is that morally acceptable? And what is this thing down here at the bottom? What is this on init? What is the state that might change? And what is state has changed? A lot of weird stuff going on there. So this opens up the question of how we're going to manage track state within the application. How do we know when things change? Who's responsible for maintaining that state over time? Now, if you look at the wider landscape of single-page application frameworks like React, Vue, Angular, and all the others, there are many, many different ways of managing client-side state. Everyone's got their own way of doing it, and it keeps changing all the time what people think the best way of doing it is. But there's one pattern in particular that has risen to the top in the last couple of years and has largely become accepted as probably the best way to do this thing. And this is the idea of a state container. A state container is a fairly simple concept. It's just the idea that instead of having all of your state scattered through all your different components, you would centralize that state into one place that deals with the business logic around how it should update, and it should have a way of issuing notifications to tell all the different parts of the UI when they should update. And that's what I'm doing here. Now, if I was implementing this in something like Vue or React, I would probably use a state container framework because there are plenty of them out there, and some of them are pretty good. But I'm not. I'm doing this in .NET. And in the .NET world, there aren't really very many mature state container frameworks. I expect there probably will be fairly soon when people decide that they want to start making them and building open source projects around that. And some of them have actually started, but it's still early days for that right now. So rather than using one of them, I want to just write my own state container just as a simple, trivial C-sharp class. It's going to be super, super basic and hopefully expresses the basic concepts. So I've got this class called AppState here. And my AppState, like I said, is responsible for tracking state and knowing when it changes. And the only state I need to track right now are what are the search results we're currently displaying and this Boolean flag that says, is the search currently in progress or not? And the other thing we have to do is have a way of issuing notifications when things change. And there are loads of different ways you could do that. You could use observables. You could use I notify property changed or other patterns like that. But I wanted to keep this really basic, so I'm going to use a good old-fashioned C-sharp event that says that stuff has changed. And, of course, I could have different events to say when dis different things have changed. But for now, it's completely sufficient just to have one event. Okay, so that is how we're basically structuring this application and managing its state, but it's kind of a bit hard to get all that into your head at once. You might feel that you don't have a really good handle on how all this stuff is really working. So to give you a better sense of what this is really like, I think we should now add a new feature of our own, and then you'll get a sense of whether this is really a nice sort of technology to work with and whether these kind of patterns are going to scale to the sort of applications that you want to do. Okay, so what feature do we want to add? Well, I want to implement this shortlist over here. Right now, it's not implemented. So when I click on these add buttons, you'll see I'm clicking and nothing is happening. Well, actually, something is happening, but you just can't see it. If you want to see it, we need to open up the browser's console here, and then when I click on add, you'll see it displays this message. To do, implement shortlist. Okay, so why is it displaying that uh, why is it logging that message? Well, if we look in our state container down here, you'll see we've got this method add to shortlist, and it's not a very 
a complete method right now. All it does is it logs this message. Okay, so we want to implement that. And to implement it, first we're going to have to have a place to store the state relating to the shortlist. That is, we're going to have a list of itineraries that the user has added, and I want to store that. So I'm going to go up here to the place where I'm storing all the state in properties, and I'm going to add a couple more properties. I'm going to add this one firstly. So privately, we're going to have a list of itineraries, and we can modify this list over time. It's not a read-only list, it's a read-write list. We can add and remove stuff to it. And then publicly, we're going to expose a read-only view of the same data. So in general, you'll want your state containers to be encapsulated, so the state container itself is the only thing that can modify its own state. And that gives you confidence that you've got uh, a central place to put any business logic associated with those state changes, and that you can ensure that notifications are raised correctly. So anyway, we've got our place to store the shortlist now. So very trivially, inside add to shortlist, I can just say shortlist.add itinerary. And then if we want anyone to know that we've just done that, we will call notify state changed. And all that is, is a method that raises the on change event. And like I said, there are lots of different ways that you could do this, but if you're gonna do it as a simple C sharp event, this is a very basic way of doing it, okay? So we are now tracking the state of the shortlist, but we're not displaying anything on the UI yet. So I want to make a new UI component that's actually gonna display the shortlist. Okay, so I'm gonna add a new component using add new item. And we haven't yet implemented any item template for Blazor components. We probably should get on with doing that, but we haven't done. Uh, it's good enough at the moment just to create a razor view, and I'm gonna call this one shortlist. Okay, so when that has been created, uh, we've got a new razor file here, and we can type anything we want to. So I'm gonna put a little message, hello from, from the new shortlist. Very good, okay, and then I want to use that. So I'll go back to main.cshtml, I'm going to say we'll have a shortlist right there, if you please. And so when I go back to the browser and reload now, we should see, did I not do that? What did I not do there? Let's try that one more time. If I reload, then we'll get, okay, hello from the new shortlist. So it's using our new component there. Very good. But I don't just want to display the message, I want to display the actual shortlist contents. So. I'm going to pass the data that I want my shortlist to have into it. I don't want to wire up my shortlist directly to the state container. I could. <coughs> but it's generally considered good practice not to wire up everything individually because then you end up with this complex system of lots of stuff updating independently. It's generally simpler for you if you just wire up a few things, a few top-level things to your state container and then pass the data that, that each component needs into it. Just like I'm passing the itineraries into search results here, I want to pass the shortlist into the shortlist component. So, just like I showed you before, I can define what parameters my shortlist component takes. And I'm gonna say it's gonna take something called itineraries, which is gonna be a collection of itineraries. And when I've got that, I can display something from there. So let's say shortlist, and to get started, I'm just gonna display itineraries.count, so we know how many things are in it. And now, on the shortlist here, I want to make use of this itineraries property. So I will, here we go. Okay, so I'm going to add itineraries and I'm gonna pass state.shortlist into it. So my shortlist should get the data and it should be updated when that changes, okay? So if I've done this correctly, then when I come back and reload, it's now gonna say shortlist zero, and then when I start clicking on these buttons, you'll see that that number is going to increase because it's adding stuff into that collection, and it's updating. Good, right, so this is a good start. But we don't wanna just display a number, we wanna display the actual contents of the shortlist. So I'll go back over here, and I'm gonna drop in a little bit of markup that I've prepared. So simply using Razor syntax, I can say for each of the itineraries, I'm gonna display a little box that displays uh, initially, I'm just going to display the airline that you are traveling with, just so that we can check that this is working correctly. So now, when I click these buttons, uh, let's get some more stuff. Okay, we'll get uh, KLM, and then we'll get Emirates, and then we'll get BA, and we can just keep on going like that. Okay, so it's working, but we don't just want to display the airline name, we want to display all the information about the itinerary. So to do that, we just need to add more Razor markup. 
And that's kind of boring, so I'm not going to go through it step by step. Instead, I'm just going to dump a massive pile of markup that's way too much for you to read, but you're just going to have to trust me that there's nothing conceptually difficult about it. All it does is it iterates over the itineraries, and for each one, it displays loads of bootstrap-related elements that's going to display stuff like the airport codes. Uh, we're using this other component to display the flight segments, and then we're displaying the airline name and the price and things like that. So, assuming all that works correctly, then back in the browser, uh, when I add stuff to my shortlist, we're now going to get these attractive-looking cards popping up that show us the stuff that's been added to the shortlist there. Okay. So, that is an example of how we can add a new feature to our application and how we can tie it into the existing structure of state management that's in there. Okay, that's good. But hey, let's do something a little bit more interesting still. Let's build an even more advanced component now. I keep claiming to you that components are very flexible and can do lots of things, but so far I've, all I've shown you is that you can use one component inside another and you can pass parameters into them. What other cool things can we do with components? Let's see. Well, to, give a, to invent a reason for why we should do this, let's think a little bit about the user experience of this website right now. <coughs> Excuse me. There's one or two UX problems, there's probably loads of problems really, but one or two that I want to focus on right now is what happens when I click this search button repeatedly. Now as you know, it's going to return different random data each time, and it takes about half a second to return every time. And the reason for that is because I just put in a hard-coded half-second delay, but of course in the real world, that things do take a non-zero amount of time. So the user probably will have to wait for some amount of time for their search results to come back, but we're not displaying any kind of indication that we're loading and waiting, so the user has no idea that we've really even acknowledged their click on the button. Also, while they are waiting for the new state to arrive, the old results below are now stale and obsolete and useless, but we're still presenting them as if they're up to date. So that's really strange and misleading that you can click on the button and it shows your old results and you don't even know that they're not the new ones. So, to solve these UX problems, I want to uh, do a different thing. When you click on the search button, I want to gray out all the stuff in the UI below it so that you can see that it's old data, you don't need it anymore, and we're loading something in the background. Okay? But, since I'm a programmer, I don't just want to implement graying out in a sort of one-off way. I want to invent a general framework for graying out anything, anytime, anywhere, on no notice. I can just gray your stuff out anytime I like uh, with a general system, okay? And I'm going to do that using a Blazor component that can gray stuff out. How could a component do that? Let's see. I'm going to add a new item, and I'm going to call this one gray out zone, and I know that text is too small to read. Anyway, here's our grey out zone, and I want the grey out zone to be able to toggle whether or not stuff is currently greyed out. So I want it to have this Boolean parameter called is greyed out that can get passed in from outside. And then as for what markup that should render, it's going to be like this. Now, if you know CSS, this will probably seem quite straightforward to you, and if you don't, it might be that you don't really get what I'm doing, but don't worry about it. It's not hugely interesting. It's just some fairly basic CSS stuff. So what I'm doing here, I'm saying that we've got a CSS class of gray out, but only if that Boolean flag is true. And when that flag is true, we're going to have this element here called cover, or with a, with a style name cover. And I've set up the CSS already so that the cover element completely fills up the boundaries of its parent using absolute positioning, and it displays a sort of translucent gray box. So it covers things over and prevents you from interacting with the stuff that's behind it. And it's only going to be there if this uh, gray out class is enabled. So whatever goes here is the thing that's going to get grayed out which is good, so I can put my UI in there. But remember, I want a completely general system for graying out anything, so what UI is going to go in there? Well, I don't know. I just need some sort of placeholder to represent the idea of an arbitrary piece of user interface. And that's a feature that we have that's quite convenient. So, I can take another parameter of type render fragment, and a render fragment represents an arbitrary piece of user interface that can be rendered and you can choose wherever you want to render it. So I've got some child content, and I want to render that child content right there. 
So it's the child content that's going to be grayed out. And now I've done that, I can go back to my main and I can use my gray out zone. So what do I want to gray out? I want to gray out the search results. So I'm going to wrap a gray out zone around the search results like that. Okay? And then I want to pass this Boolean flag is grayed out there. And I'm going to say that this thing is grayed out if and only if we've currently got a search in progress. Okay? Let's see if it works, shall we? Back in the browser, going to reload. And now when I click on the search button, you'll see that that bit of the UI below gets nicely grayed out while ever we've got a search in progress. And we can, of course, reuse our gray out zone wherever we want to do the same trick elsewhere. So that's another cool thing that we can do with components. Okay. Let's move on to our fourth thing that we can do in Blazor applications, and that is JavaScript interop. Okay, so I'm sure that you can probably anticipate scenarios where you would need to call into JavaScript code from your .NET. For example, you might want to call browser APIs. Browsers have got lots of APIs that let your application do all kinds of things, uh, from very simple things like just focusing an element to things like switching into full screen mode or even uh, using the payment requests API to ask your user to give them some uh, to give you some money. And you might want to use any of those APIs, or you might want to integrate with third-party JavaScript libraries. So that is a thing that we want to let you do. So, what's the scenario for JavaScript interop in Flight Finder? Well, let's imagine that I am a very price-sensitive user, and I want to get the cheapest flight I can. And since I know that this is just random data, I'm just going to keep clicking the search button over and over again until I eventually find a really good deal. Okay, so I've got a, a very cheap deal here, $167 for this flight. I'm really pleased with myself for finding that, so I'm going to add that into my shortlist. Brilliant. Super happy about that. But then, since I'm a user, and users are generally just mad and they do crazy things for no reason at all, for, for no reason that anyone can think of, I'm now going to reload the page, okay? And when I reload the page, what's going to happen to my shortlist? Well, it's going to get lost. Oh, no, I'm a very sad user now. So clearly what we want to do is have some way of preserving the shortlist across page loads. And most of the web developers in the audience will probably think, oh, that's going to be easy. If we can use JavaScript, then we can just store stuff in local storage, and it's just going to be there, and it'll be nice and persistent. And you're right, and that's exactly what we're going to do. So we want to use JavaScript interop to store some, store some stuff in browser local storage. But do you know what's even easier than using JavaScript interop APIs? It's not using JavaScript interop APIs. It's just letting someone else do that work for you. That's a general tip for life, by the way. Uh, I would strongly recommend always just let other people do stuff for you. And that's a thing that we're going to be able to do right now. So. I want to add local storage capabilities to my application, but I want someone else to do that for me. So I'm going to go and have a look at what NuGet packages exist. NuGet is .NET's package management system, if you didn't know. And I can go in there, I can see what packages exist. Well, let's have a look. I happen to know that there's this thing uh, that I found earlier <coughs> called Cloud Create ASP.NET Core Blazor Browser Storage. Super name. I imagine some kind of PR agency came up with that, really cool, uh, and it adds Blazor local and session storage support, all right, and it's made by this wonderful person called Florian Dorendorf, and that is going to give us just the functionality that we want. So the point I'm making with all this is, although you can do JavaScript interrupt directly yourself, and I'm going to show you that in like five minutes, we also want to make sure that you don't always have to. It should be possible to pull in packages where other people have figured out the details for you and they just give you some nice .NET APIs to work with. And that's what I'm going to do now. So I've read the docs for this package already, and I know that the way to use it is to register local storage as a service in my dependency injection system. So in Blazor, the dependency injection system is configured here in program.cs. And so, for example, this is where I'm telling it that app state is one of the singletons that can get injected into any of my components. And I can add other stuff here as well. So now I've got that package installed, I'm going to say services.addStorage. All right, and I need a namespace import for that. And that's going to make local and session storage available as a DI service. So I can now use that in any of my components or in my state container. And I want to use it in the state container. So, 
I'm going to change the constructor parameters for App State. I'm going to say I want to get an instance of local storage being, being passed in here, and I'll call that local storage instance. Okay. And then I need to store that in a field on my class here so I can use it. And I'll make a private read-only local storage. Call that local storage. And I'm going to set the value of that to be whatever gets passed in to the constructor. Right? So now I've got my local storage. I can use it. Where do I want to use it? Well, I want to use it here inside my add to shortlist. I'm going to say whenever you add stuff to a shortlist, I want to save the updated version of it. So I'm going to say local storage dot set item. And then it wants me to give a key, so let's call it, I don't know, a shortlist. That would make sense. And then what do we want to store in there? Well, we store everything that's in this shortlist right now. Okay. Let's see if this works then, shall we? I'm going to go back into my browser now. And I want to show you, firstly, uh, what happens uh, when I try to evaluate what's in local storage already. And the answer is nothing. I've got nothing in local storage yet, but... When I click on one of these add buttons now to add something to shortlist and we evaluate it again, you'll see we've now got all this stuff in there. We've got all this JSON serialized representation of the data that I've just added. Okay, so it's working. We're interoperating with local storage. So does that mean we're done? If I hit reload right now, is my $549 flight still gonna be there? Let's find out. The answer is no. Why is it not there? Uh, that's because, although we've implemented some logic for saving something in local storage, we've not implemented any logic for loading it back. That's not very difficult, though. We'll do that as follows. Uh, we will say, okay, local storage, please have a look. Is there anything that's stored under this key of shortlist? If there is, deserializer is going to be an array of itineraries. And then if you've got that, we're going to add it into the new shortlist array that's in the new instance of the application. Okay, so now if I hit reload one more time, instead of starting off empty, you'll see it starts off with the stuff that's been loaded back from local storage. So that does work, and well done, Cloud Create people, for making that lovely thing for us. That's all very good. But I know you're thinking, oh, that's very nice, but that's cheating because you're just using a package that already exists. What if I have to write the JavaScript interrupt stuff myself? What if I want to do something that there is no package for, or I just need to do some other custom thing? So I will show you, but I'm going to show you in the context of another hopefully interesting scenario, and that is library projects. So you're familiar with the idea of normal class library projects that allow you to reuse uh, chunks of C-sharp in other projects. Well, there's a Blazor equivalent to that. It's called a Blazor library project, and it lets you include not only just regular .NET code, but also you can include Blazor UI components in there as well and reuse them and share them. And also, you can include static content such as CSS or images or JavaScript, whatever you want, and you can bundle all that stuff into a project that you reuse, and if you're feeling particularly generous, you can even publish it to NuGet so that other people can use it as well. And that is how the Cloud Create package was created. So let me give you an example of doing that. Now, you probably would think that the way to create a Blazor library project, if you know Visual Studio, would be to go add new project and go through there. Well, that is the way it should work, but we haven't yet implemented a VS template for it. We really ought to get on with doing that, but we just haven't done yet. So for now, the only way to create a Blazor library project is on the command line. In fact, you can create any Blazor project on the command line. Once you've installed the uh, Blazor packages, when you go .NET new, you'll see that alongside all the other things you can create, we can create some Blazor stuff. So we can create a Blazor hosted project, we can create a Blazor standalone project, and most relevant for us right now, we can create a Blazor library, or Blazor lib for short. So I want to do that right now. In fact, let me zoom back in so you can see what I'm typing. I'm going to say .NET new Blazor lib, and we specify where we want that to go, and I want it to be called my Blazor library. Okay, so we'll create that and that will put all the files on disk, and then we will need to go into VS and add that to our solution. So I'm gonna go add existing project, and then I'll quickly skip through all these menus to find the one I want, which is this one, and then that is now added as a fourth project in our solution. And obviously that would be all automated uh, when we've got a VS template. 
Okay. Now, I want to add a reference from my client library to my new Blazor library so that I can start to use it. So I'm going to go add reference, and then I'll choose my Blazor library up there. Okay, very good. Okay, so we've got a reference. And there's one other thing that you need to do right now if you want to consume a Blazor library project. And it's pretty weird, and it's not very nice, and we need to fix this and make it so you don't have to do it. But I'm afraid right now, when you add a new Blazor library project, you have to go to your view imports file and manually add this weird thing, add tag helper, everything from my Blazor library. Okay, so I appreciate that's strange and we'll come up with some solution that means you don't have to do that, but for now you do. All right, so now I've added a reference to this My Blazor library. And since I've done that, uh, I can consume whatever's in there. Let's see what is in there, shall we? So what we've got inside there is we've got a Blazor component, component one.cshtml. And what's that? Well, it just displays uh, some static HTML. But it's a normal Blazor component and it can do anything that Blazor components can do. Also, we've got some static content. We've got some CSS, we've got a background PNG image, and we've got some stuff for JS interrupt that I'll show you in a minute. Okay, so let's uh, have a go at using component one inside our Flight Finder client. Let's say that for whatever reason, I want to put component one at the top of my search results. So I'm gonna go in here and I'm gonna say, please give me a component one right there, if you don't mind. Uh, now I've done that, if I come back and reload, then we should see, here we go, here's our component one. This Blazor component is defined in the My Blazor library package. And that shows you that you can put whatever stuff you want in there, uh, including static content, because you can see the red dotted outline there. That's defined in the CSS file. And you can see the stripy background. That's defined as a, as a PNG, ima PNG image inside the uh, package as well. So you can bundle everything that you need for your components into libraries. And then you can reuse them across projects if you want to, and you can publish them to NuGet if you want to. Okay, so that's using components, but let's get back to the JavaScript interrupt, okay? How does that really work? So here's an example of doing it manually. So I've got here this static c -sharp method called prompt, and it's gonna take a message, as, yeah, message, which is of type string, and it's gonna return a string. And what it actually does is it's gonna invoke some JavaScript. And the syntax for invoking JavaScript is like this, registered function dot invoke, and then you can pass some stuff into it and you can get some stuff back out. And you have to give the identifier of a thing that's been registered. And then to actually re register it, you write some JavaScript or TypeScript or CoffeeScript or whatever other thing you like. Um, so here I've got a JavaScript file and it registers this function with that identifier. And it's a normal JavaScript function which takes this message parameter and the implementation is very simple. It's simply gonna display a prompt using the browser's native prompt feature. So it calls prompt, passes the message and it's gonna return whatever value gets returned. So that's how you can do JavaScript interrupt. And you don't have to do it in library packages if you don't want. You can put these files in your main project, but I just wanted to show you the library packages as well. So let's try and use it, shall we? I'm gonna try and use this uh, inside my state container. I'll say that when you've done a search and whenever we've got some results come back, I'm gonna say example JS interop. Uh, I want to call prompt and I'll pass my message. Okay, uh, so if that works, then when I'm back in the browser now and I click on search and we get some results, you'll see it's worked. It's called into the JavaScript, it's passed through my message from the .NET code, and whatever the user types, uh, whatever the user types in here will get passed back into the .NET code. So that's a very simple example, but hopefully you can see that you can put completely arbitrary JavaScript logic in there to interact with third-party libraries or to call any browser API that you want to. And then you can, if you want, put it in a library package, reuse it, publish it to NuGet if you feel like. All right. So we are basically out of time now. So I've shown you a whole bunch of things that you can do with a slightly more advanced project that hopefully gives you a sense of what it's like to build this sort of thing. Now, I need to remind you one further time that this is not a shipping product. This is an experimental idea. And it's my hope, at least, and the hope of many of us, that this will become a shipping product, but that, that's not decided yet. We honestly don't know. And whether or not that happens is largely going to depend on what feedback we get from potential customers, potential users of this product. 
So I, I really would like you, as much as possible, to give us feedback through any channels that you can about whether you think this is useful to you, whether you would use it, what you don't like about it, maybe. Just give us some ideas what you think about this thing. To give you a slightly broader picture of all the functionality we would have in mind for a sort of version one of this, if it was to become a thing, well, obviously I've been showing you this component model in some detail, but there's other more basic features as well, like layouts and routing. They'd be familiar to most web developers. They're already implemented. I didn't bother showing you because it's just not very interesting. Uh, what else is there? Well, obviously there needs to be very first class tooling support. Uh, we haven't got everything in there yet, so we haven't got all the project templates right. There's still one or two quirks in the IntelliSense, but you know, we've got a lot of the basics in there already. Uh, we've got dependency injection, which I've shown you using. Uh, we have not yet got, but obviously we would need, uh, for typical business applications, a comprehensive system of working with entering data. So all your usual forms and validation stuff needs to be very slick and nice to work with. Uh, obviously, you would have to have debugging support. Now, at the moment, we don't have support for debugging the .NET that's running in your browser. We do have a proof of concept of it, actually. So, you know when you open your browser DevTools and you can see your JavaScript, and you can set breakpoints on it and step through it and so on? We've got a prototype already of uh, making it so that you see your C-sharp source code inside the DevTools and you can set breakpoints on it there and step through it and that's really lovely. Um, so hopefully we will do something like that but there's quite a lot of work involved in making that really robust end to end. So that's another thing that's uh, in progress. Uh, auto rebuild means whenever you change your sources it just automatically builds and updates in the browser. Uh, JavaScript inter interrupt, I've showed you some of that. Server side rendering, I didn't show you, it's not implemented yet but it would be very, very simple for us to implement because Blazor components can run on the server just as well as they can run on the client. It's all .NET after all if you've got .NET, .NET on the server. So we can easily render the initial application UI on the server so the user can see that without even having to download any of the JavaScript and WebAssembly. Uh, component packages, I showed you that. Publishing just works. When you publish, it gets all the right files in the right place, whether you're deploying to Azure or your own servers or anything else. Uh, assembly trimming, that means that uh, every time you build, we figure out which parts of the assemblies you're not using and we strip them out because it's very important that the resulting application is as small as it needs to be when it runs in the browser. Uh, so we've already implemented some of that, but we have got plans to take that even further. And then finally, what about browsers that don't even support WebAssembly? You probably would think that there's no way they're going to run these applications, but the cool thing is they will. They will run it. And that's because WebAssembly is designed to fall back on an older standard called ASM.js, and we've got that already. So when the application is started up, uh, it detects whether the browser supports WebAssembly, and if it doesn't, it loads a different version of the Mono runtime, which is compiled to ASM.js. So even on older browsers like IE 11 or probably older, the applications will work as well. So that is all we have time for. I hope that is of some interest to you, and I hope you'll try it out and give us some feedback. If you go to this website, blazer.net, you'll get all the instructions for downloading it, and there's a lot of documentation about uh, how to use it. So, um, so yeah, that's it. We're out of time. I hope that's been fun, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Please remember to evaluate the session on the way out to determine what the agenda is going to be next year, and have a really good uh, rest of your time here. Thank you.